And I, as I had promised, a very, very special guest on to talk about something that will, it's going to, I guess, Tana, what should I say, rock their worlds, right? It's going to rock your world. It's going to, it's a preconceived notions that you have, things that you think you know uh, about the stock market. Wow, this is going to blow, yeah. let me just say it'll blow your mind. So the Ponzi Factor is the name of the book, The Simple Truth About Investment Profits. And Tan Liu, I'm honored to have you on the Louis B. Free Radio Show. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you. I'm honored. Tell us about yourself before we get into the book. Sure. Um, I basically uh, graduated from a university with a economic and finance degree. I worked in uh, for two hedge funds and uh, managed distressed assets for a bank for about 10 years in finance and um, left the industry in 2015 to basically uh, publish this book. But at the same time, uh, during that 10 years, uh, I, I, what I realized was the finance system itself is pretty much a, a one big scam. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's kind of my background. I, again, that's pretty horrifying for people to hear. But be, I, and I want to I want to get into that. But before mm-hmm. we do, a mm-hmm. little bit more about that path for you, if you don't mind. Sure. So this book I published early, um, earlier this year um, in 2018, but really it was a project that started back in 2012. Um, what really made me inspire me to put this out there was after I saw one of my hedge funds. Um, it was the second hedge fund I worked for. And I saw how in 2008, um, they were basically doing something a lot of financial strategies do, where any financial strategy, let me just put it this way, any financial strategy that involves some kind of synthetic asset, as in it can be a credit default swap, it could be a life insurance policy in their case, or it could be a stock that really has no intrinsic value. Almost always, the profits that people experience come from other investors that are pouring money into the same scheme. Um, and which, so the money doesn't actually appear from anywhere. It always, almost always comes from other investors pouring money to the scheme. And this is exactly how uh, the stock market works. When people buy a stock for $10, they sell for $11. That money doesn't come from the company that that uh, supposedly made money or didn't make money in Tesla's case. Um, it always comes from uh, another investor who, who are pouring money into the system. And that by definition, of course, is a Ponzi scheme. Uh, what I saw this fund do in 2009 was pretty much that, and uh, where they basically were marking up assets uh, to unrealistic values that they would never really sell them for. And when they didn't sell it for, for, the, for the values that they thought it would sell for, uh, they just ended up buying back their own policies with other investors' money. Uh, this is something I just, uh, a story I, I describe in detail in chapter one of the book. And it really just opened my eyes to how uh, shady the entire finance industry is. And it's very important to, to point out that what, my, what that fund did and what I saw and you know, everything I talked about in the book are legal. They're not illegal like Madoff. Yeah, yeah. They're illegal. And that's the really scariest part is – Madoff, what Madoff did is nothing compared to what these companies are doing right now every single day. So, we, we, like you say, I mean that's the that's one of the the horrifying things aspects of it that it is legal that mm-hmm. people didn't you know that the way you talk about this I mean the way you write about it in the Ponzi factor is uh, mm-hmm. a very very. <sighs> Uh, uh, frightening, I guess I should say for people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, frightening that people mm-hmm. don't know this yet. People will say, mm-hmm. and I'm already getting some early uh, messages, but I've made money in the market, Louis. Well, uh, that, mm-hmm. to me, they're saying it to me. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you respond? People say that, you know. They, of course, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll hear from some people that may have lost plenty of money in the market, yeah. also. But yeah, how do you respond? Yeah. 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 Bernard made off with this scam by the got investigated and uh, when his whole fund blew up and stuff. Investigators found that more than half of his accounts actually showed a profit. The total money lost, of course, was greater, but as far as his accounts go, they actually showed more more of them actually showed a profit. Let me give you an example, a real simple example, right? If you get a if you if somebody if a company issues a stock and, and the person who buys that, let's say for a dollar that person could sell that stock to another person for uh, $2. Mm-hmm. 
and that will become a person for three dollars. And just could keep going for up to a hundred dollars, and you'll have ninety nine people that make a dollar yeah. along the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Problem, however, the problem, however, is you got a guy at the end of the road who is down a hundred dollars, right? And that person wants his money back still. So the whole system is actually negative sum that you can include the fact that there's transaction fees in between, even though you saw 99 people make $1 off of every transaction and a nice upward sloping curve, okay, except for there's that one man holding the, a piece of paper that he wants money for. And the only way he's going to get it, the only foreseeable way, is by selling it to another investor. Now, I will address my critics real quick because I already know what they're thinking. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, all right, a company could buy back the stock. Hypothetically speaking, a company could pay dividends, but on a very foreseeable basis, on a very observable basis, that actually doesn't happen. Um, so you got this situation where people can make money along the way, but at the end of the day, the problem is the people who are holding stocks right now actually have zero dollars, and what they're holding is a note with an abstraction, a number attached to it. And the only way, foreseeable way, that they can really get money for their stock is by selling it to another investor. When you, w w the, the moment, I, well, let, there's a number of places I want to go. And I just, because sure. I think this is so important, I think the book is so important for people to understand the simple truths about investment profits, the Ponzi factor, mm -hmm. of course, available everywhere and everywhere online. Again, I'm speaking with the author, my guest is Tan Liu, and again, the book available everywhere. It's the PonziFactor.com. We've got links up to the PonziFactor.com. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you write initially in the book, and mm -hmm. I, the most dangerous ideas are those that are true. And that other quote that you had, um, um, I love mm -hmm. this. Uh, All truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. <laughs> second, it's widely opposed. Third, it's accepted as self-evident. I mean, it's really, really, mm -hmm. really fascinating when you think about some of what is, is, is going on. But tell me, again, when you, when you first got to the point where, I don't know, what, how do I want to say it, a, um, an aha moment where, where you, were, where you were mm. realized exactly what was going on? Uh-huh. Uh, okay, so, so the aha moment, right? And the funny thing is that there, when I first realized that the stock market was a pon is a Ponzi scheme um, is of course when I realized wait a second when that stock gets sold to somebody else basically if I if I sell my stock for a profit um, in capital gains that comes from somebody else um, it, it was not really it was of course an aha moment when I realized that but let me put it this way I was in denial okay I was in denial I, I used to say the same things to defend the stock market just like my critics who are probably criticizing me when they hear me talk about it being a Ponzi scheme none of my critics by the way ever read the book they just criticize me um, sure. because they saw a two minute tra trailer yeah, online right. and they think yeah. I, I didn't cover yeah. everything under the sun um, but basically I was in denial really and it was more of a stages where I realized that and then over a period of months I started to just accept it more and more only because you keep seeing these actions in the market. You keep seeing people on CNBC like Jim Cramer explain why Tesla stocks like Tesla, which can skyrocket from 20 to three, $380 while the company loses $4.7 billion, right? Make up these ludicrous excuses on how that can happen. Okay. When you specifically know why it's happening it's because the stock has nothing to do with the underlying company it's totally monetarily disconnected from the underlying company and the valuation of that stock is coming from inflow of cash from new investors the ponzi factor and so over time it just becomes more and more clear it's not something that was like i even wanted to accept it at first but over time, it just becomes impossible to deny. And it's just when you know the truth, when you see the truth, and you watch all these ludicrous uh, finance analysts uh, say their spill on CNBC, or even academics go on CNBC and Bloomberg and say their spill, and it makes absolutely what they're saying is totally unprovable, totally hypothetical. Um, and, and they're simply avoiding this very, very simple truth that I describe in this book, which is provable, which is also falsifiable, okay, which basically makes it a legitimate idea. Illegitimate ideas I, are those that you cannot prove right or wrong. And that is what finance people, if you listen to CNBC, you listen to these analysts, 
you they you will everything they say you can't exactly prove it wrong but you can't prove it right either and you know what Karl Popper the philosopher calls that he calls that a pseudoscience idea okay pseudoscience idea that are completely worthless and that is exactly what these finance people are talking about every single day on CNBC versus the simple truth of what I realized it's this aha moment it didn't quite come as a moment but over time it just became so evident so clear that you can't forget about it. I, I've got to ask you, and I hope you don't mind me asking you this, sure. but I'm sure you've, you've thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. Being the guy that, you know, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. The, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the guy that brings these out, do you, any, you know, you got to be getting hammered or dismissed, as, yeah. as we were talking about. And what are your thoughts on that? I expect it. I expect it, but at the same, uh, I mean, at the same time, my critics have absolutely no um, valid argument against what I'm saying. I mean, ultimately, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, I, I get hammered here and there, but but it's funny though because let me put it this way: finance people, especially my critics, are very predictable. All right, I mean, I don't care if I'm having a conversation with some some random person online, or maybe somebody from the SEC or somebody from big corporation. I know what they're thinking and what they're going to say, reply, and counter with five steps deeper than they can act, ever imagine. <laughs> so in a way, their arguments are actually very predictable, and I know how to address all of them. The very fundamental first argument they always come out with, well, stocks are equity ownership instruments, and the reality is they're not. Um, and I, I explained that in Chapter 1, because you're not most for most stocks, you never get dividends, meaning there's no monetary connection. So, so, there's, so there's no real ownership instrument there aside from just a label so when they when they hammer me and when they attack me i know how to address all of their arguments and and right now like i said the the, the number one argument they have uh, or the number one style of argument they have are bringing up hypothetical ideas like how google could pay dividends tesla could buy back stocks or tesla could make money down the road and you know i just say uh, something very simple well those are hypothetical situations. What I'm describing, the Ponzi factor of people exchanging money, this is an observable one. You want to play in my world? You want to debate me? Explain it with observable facts. Explain it with something we can actually see. Not these hypothetical ideas how Berkshire Hathaway could start buying back their own stocks. And at that point, they become silent. Yeah. Could they might someday? Who knows when? Yeah, <laughs> maybe exactly, if right? maybe if you know. I, I, I hate to say. I, I mean, not not like playing the lottery, but thinking. Well, I could win the lottery. They could. They they might. You know, I might win the lottery. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but but you know, mm -hmm. odds are I won't. Uh, the Tesla. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit, if you don't mind, more about that. The Tesla that you talk about. Mm -hmm. you talk about the Tesla. Sure. Tesla, first of all, I got nothing against Tesla or Elon, except for now, the more I'm researching the guy, he's more of a scumbag than I thought. But, um, but nonetheless, uh, Tesla was basically a prime example of this Ponzi mechanics at work, because this is a company that, um, that made no money. In fact, since they've been public, they've lost $4.7 billion. And during this time, their stocks ascended from $20 to $380. And, of course, the uh, number one question I want to propose to people is how can that logically happen, right? As in, if stocks are real ownership instruments, how on earth can uh, investors who own this company that loses $4.7 billion, and the early investor, how can they make out like bandits, okay? And, and uh, Jim Cramer's um, logic and reasoning is it's a cult because apparently – you know, SEC started registering cults. I missed that memo, but yeah, okay, Jim, sure. Uh, my explanation is quite simple. Uh, it's that Tesla stocks, like all stocks, are not connected to the company, um, and it's not a real ownership instrument. And the reason why their stock can be bid up to 380 while the company loses $4.7 billion is because that money doesn't come from the company. It comes from other investors. So Tesla just happens to be a picture-perfect example of this. Now, uh, on the other hand, though, too, Google is also a decent example of this, and Google made money because I point out that um, Google, between 2007 and 2011, they made uh, $28 billion. But you, if you own Google stocks, you wouldn't make anything because the stocks stay relatively flat during that period, and, and, um, and Google doesn't pay dividends. And it's not that I'm trying to cherry-pick dates or anything. Trust me, I could, if I want to cherry-pick dates, I could actually show people when – they would have owned the stock and lost money 
how Google made billions and billions of dollars. It's simply a simple example it's not in a that. time frame, and this happens a lot too with Berkshire, Facebook, a lot of companies. It's just a simple example to show that guess what? Stocks are not real ownership instruments because you own a company, um, and you should get some of the profits. And uh, clearly, all these examples are literal the market where the stock price is completely disconnected from the company, and it's because it is disconnected from the company. Again, when you talk, we're talking about the Ponzi factor, the Ponzi factor dot com, the Ponzi factor dot com. Again, one of the biggest myths about stocks is the belief that profits come from stocks, that profits from stocks come from the earnings of the underlying companies. When companies make money, they share the profits with their investors. And again, what you're writing about is that couldn't be further from, I shouldn't say further from the, yeah, further from the truth. Mm-hmm. Correct, Tan? Correct. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it is very, very, very far from the truth. Yes. <laughs> and Ponzi again. When you when you re- the Ponzi, the issue with the Ponzi, and again you talk about it, but but the way you the way you present it, and then say that everything is legal, and of course you're talking about Bernie uh-huh. Madoff. But and I think most of us know the Bernie Madoff thing. And again, you know, I. I've mm-hmm. argued with, not argued, discussed with people, and I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Again, it's horrific when we see the shows and you see people who lost everything and had their life and, and you know just just destroyed, mm-hmm. yeah. economically destroyed. But maybe initially thought, well, I'll be able to at some point I'll be able to pay them back, and you know, I, I, a lot of people, you know, it gets to be mm-hmm. bad thinking. But what you're saying mm-hmm. is this is the market. This isn't bad thinking. This is. The stock market. Am I making any sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. I mean, it's the stock market. But the issue I have with the whole system, right, is not that. Look, if people want to gamble on this imaginary paper that's really worth nothing, because the 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 holder of the paper, the stock, right. I mean, the stock's not backed by anything. Okay, Tesla stocks, Google stocks, they're not backed by anything. I mean, the person receives no money, and none of these companies back up the value of their stock. And if people just want to go out there and play and gamble on the stock and and say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to gamble on the fact that I could sell to another person that that wants to give me more money, right? I'm totally cool with that. I mean, I'm I'm fine that that's what people want to do. The problem is it's sold to people as an investment instrument, not a gambling instrument. You could be 18 and buy this garbage, but you've got to be 21 to play blackjack. It's sold to people as an investment instrument, and it's sold to people um, as as some a piece of a company when it's really not a piece of a company. Uh, and that's the real issue I have with this whole yeah. thing. What's the difference between Madoff and Google stocks? Madoff technically traded nothing, air, okay, air. Now, Google stocks, okay, is equivalent to air. Um, look at their uh, C shares, which are which make up um, half their market cap. They have two types, Class A and Class C. They're Class C shares. None of their stocks pay dividends, first of all, but their Class C shares don't even have voting rights. So if you have this thing, you got you receive no money from the Google. You're not allowed to vote on anything. Google doesn't back the value of that thing at all. So what the heck are you playing with out there? I mean, what is what the heck is supposedly worth? Twelve hundred dollars <laughs> that people are, are trading right now. It, it's an imaginary Google sticker. That's it. And I mean, what's the difference between that and Madoff? Well, I guess you could say there's a Google sticker involved. <laughs> and but at the end of the day, they're, they're both technically they're both technically nothing, right? I'm so, sorry. Yeah. I'm so, but it's funny how you. It's it's it's. It, I guess it, it's uh, funny that how you say it, but it's. Um, how do I want to say it? It's funny, yeah. but it's but it's really not. It's pretty horrifying, right? It's pretty horrifying when you it, think it, about it, it. It is. I mean, it is. I think if you own Google stocks, I think <laughs> yes. So yeah, it, it, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's it. That is kind of how the system works. And um, I laugh when these companies like report. I mean, or, or these news shows talk about how Google's almost worth a trillion dollars or something like that. The math formula. Let me put it this way: the math formula is in finance. And these ideas they have are nothing short of ridiculous. When I read research papers and textbooks, I write LOL next to some of the lines okay, as notes yeah. because I just want to highlight how ridiculous it is. Uh-huh. I mean, this whole idea of market cap, for example, it's based on a price times the number of shares. Okay, So if Google stocks are trading at $1,200, uh, let's say, on Friday, then that price is going to be applied to 348 million shares of their C shares. Okay. Now, I'm pointing that out because here's the problem. That $1,200 price was achieved with a volume of 1.5 million shares on Friday. 
all right? And you're applying that same price to 348 million shares, even though half a percent of those shares were actually traded, all right? If I go to the market and buy one stock for $1,203, all right? That $1,203, that $3 will be multiplied by 348 million. Basically, their valuation would go up, their market cap would go up by $1 billion because I introduced <sighs> dollars into the system okay <laughs> so that gives you an example of just how messed up these formulas are and and um and i guess it's also a little scary because in the sense that if you if you if somebody actually has uh let's say thirty thousand dollars of stocks in their portfolio what they don't realize for the most part is uh that they actually have zero dollars the moment you buy a stock your money's gone that's it and and the reality is they are not entitled to that thirty thousand dollars they can't just simply they, the idea that they can just simply redeem it in the market whenever they want is actually not true because everyone holding that has that same idea. And like I said, on Friday, every single day, only about like 1% of the actual outstanding shares are traded or something like that. So when you, again, bringing this forward, mm -hmm. at what point do you mind? Are you good time-wise? Tony, are you? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, 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 I'm good. I, I, um, and I know it's bright and early for you, and I appreciate you doing this very, <laughs> very much. Well, it's, again, no it's problem. important. You know, people have to have responsibility, and and you can't be, you can't mm -hmm. make responsible decisions unless you have information. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not. A, Far be it for me uh, <laughs> giving anybody any financial advice. I'm not nobody. Nobody wants financial mm -hmm. advice from me. But you've got to be at least mm -hmm. aware. It doesn't mean uh, that people shouldn't do what they decide to do. I mean, you know, you decide to invest mm -hmm. in the stock market again. I'm. I'm loaded with people that are telling me that they made money in the market they made money in the market again and mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say this but you know uh, mm -hmm. as my wife always says my greatest assets my greatest liability there's no filter between my brain, mm -hmm. brain and my mouth so I'm, I am going to say it I knew a guy that 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 knew a lot about horse racing and I'm I'm opposed to horse racing animal rights guy but anyhow but what, what he used mm -hmm. to say is he said don't ever believe he said Louis don't ever believe these guys that say how much they win on the track because what they're not telling mm -hmm. us they're not they're not bottom lining it they're not telling you the races they lost and what the net net profit or loss is something so he used to say something like that he mm -hmm. had a much better way of saying it and that's kind of i guess and i'm not saying it's kind of like this yes there's people that have made great money in the market yeah there's people that have 401ks etc mm -hmm. but you need to know the reality yeah. of it correct i mean there's people on ponzi schemes yeah. that have made a lot of money people have made money in ponzi yeah, schemes so, correct so, so yes yeah. so so here's the problem with a lot of people who may be saying that they made money, okay? If they're holding stocks, they haven't made money. Okay, they're holding nothing, actually, if they're holding stocks. Um, this idea that a lot of people, of course, yeah, well, my portfolio is doing great. Well, really, your portfolio, yeah? I mean, <laughs> but, well, okay, that's not real money. That is not real money at all. That is an abstraction. That number comes from the exchange of money. It is fundamentally different from money itself that you can possess, you can trace, and you can hide under your mattress, and you can spend. Um, let me, and this is, a, this is a pretty clear way to see it, I think, for some people. Right now, the stock market value, the NYSE and the NASDAQ, has a total combined value of, I think, $31 trillion or something like that. Um, but there's only $1.6 trillion of real money in circulation in the entire U.S. economy. All right? And also, if we look at the most lenient form of measurement of money, which is the M2, uh, that also includes banknotes, aside from hard currency, because we have a fractional reserve system. That total is only around $13 trillion. And most of that is not even available for the stock market. So, so right there, we see that people who are holding stocks think they're entitled to $31 trillion because that yeah. is the market cap. Yeah. That, yeah. Composed, that is the sum of 401ks. That is some of people who see, much, see the dollar values in their stock accounts. However... They're not entitled to that. Why? Because that kind of money doesn't simply simply doesn't even exist. So, I mean, right there, if they think they're making money and it's actually in stocks, they have not received money yet. And the fact that they think they can cash out tomorrow and just make money, that is not a fact. That is actually a massive assumption that is built on two two assumptions. One, somebody is there to buy for the price that they see it at because the price that they see it at now is based on the last transaction, not the next transaction. 
second assumption, assuming that assumption is met, second assumption is no one else has the same idea of selling it. So they're also the only ones in the market who wants to sell that price. And of course, I'm not saying that they can't sell it, okay? What I am pointing out is that this idea, I can just sell it tomorrow and get my money back, um, is actually based on two assumptions. And of course, even if they can get their money back, right? And where's that money coming from? Another investor, just like how it works in a Ponzi scheme. I, I, again, it not not. Un, I, mm-hmm. I hate to say, you know, because when you were talking mm-hmm. about Bernie Bernie Madoff earlier, the the Bernie Madoff thing that again we all seem to yeah. know about, you know, because you know because it was so high profile and because so many people's lives were. I, I, I hate to say destroyed, but their 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 financial lives certainly uh, right. destroyed in that process that built up, mm-hmm. and I'm sure there are many stocks that that has mm-hmm. happened with people, but the difference is they may not have put their life savings into mm-hmm. it. Am I making any sense, Tom, you? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. I mean, and uh, here's the thing I want to also mention is really we have no idea how much money people have lost in a stock market. No idea. As in, we don't have a database that keeps track of investor losses. This was actually one a very important fact I realized in my research is that no one actually knows how much money people have made and lost. And uh, they just simply go on this assumption that people have made money because they see that the market cap, the $31 trillion thing, grow and grow, right? But like, but again, they're mistaking that for real money. We're not talking, I'm not talking about uh, just amateurs mistaking it. I'm talking about university professors who write textbooks. They mistaken it. I've heard uh, a guy from the University of Chicago on his lectures online. University of Chicago is one of the best schools out there, okay? The finance guy basically keeps talking about the stock market value as if you have real money. It is fundamentally wrong. This is a guy who teaches finance at one of the top universities, and it is fundamentally wrong. I think he just simply doesn't even understand this very basic thing. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, so it's a kind of like we don't even know how many people made or lost money, and you talk about Madoff. That's one scheme that's wrapped up, and we're getting an idea of how many people lost and made money. Um, more lost, of course, more lost, uh, of course, than than one as far as total dollar goes. But then I go back to what this, what the investigators found at the very beginning is actually still what is showing now, which is that most of his accounts actually showed a profit. Wow. The Ponzi Factor is the name of the book, The Simple Truth About Investment Profits. ThePonziFactor.com, the website, ThePonziFactor.com, obviously, links up at LouisFreeShow.com, et cetera. When you, uh, uh, your, your, your hope, I should ask you, uh, you know, when mm-hmm. you finished writing the book and actually handed it over to, to be published, mm-hmm. your hope is, is what? My hope is... I'm still trying to understand what my end goal is right now. Are you? Really, what I really <laughs> wanted, really, what I wanted to was just tell people the truth and expose, uh, you know, the scam for what it is. Um, but I guess one way to put what I really want is I, I hope to bring about meaningful change, meaningful change, not just some garbage uh, change or temporary change, but just really meaningful change. Um, because the things I explain in my book, they're fundamental, as in they affect stock market crashes. Uh, from mm. whatever since the 1920s to and also yeah. future crashes that we'll see down the road because I'm expressing uh. a fundamental idea that that uh, applies to just simply how the valuation of the stock and how, how the mechanics of how people are actually making money when they buy and sell stock. So, and um, I hope to bring meaningful change through this. Um, I don't know exactly how that, that's going to happen yet, but I think the first step is to just inform people of the truth. And then when we were all aware of the problems and how this whole thing works, and then we'll figure, we'll move towards a solution together. Again, that's the least we can do is, is make sure that people know the truth about it. That again, you know, you're talk, we're talking about um, how, what do I want to say? We we hear every every once in a while about cleaning up Wall Street, and and, and mm-hmm. we, we hear that, but it doesn't seem to be that that ever really happens correct yeah. I mean, you know more about it than I, obviously obviously a lot more about it than i do but <laughs> we hear the words the words always sound good oh reform there this you know we hear those mm-hmm. words but mm-hmm. but does it ever yeah. happen yeah it's it's tough uh because the wall street they have a 
way of getting away with stuff. I'm hoping to, with this book, because I explained something and uh, things in such simple, and obvious ways that we can bring about change, not with complex regulations um, or anything like that, but just with simple ones, like let's get a database that tracks investor losses, <laughs> right? Let's classify stocks as gambling instruments because uh, there's, it doesn't make re- any sense why 18 year old kids can open online trading accounts and have to go to wait till they're 21 to go to go to a casino. Um, and yeah. let's just bring about those, those simple ideas and, and those simple, these simple things to bring about simple change to really uh, change wall street. It's funny because, it's the idea of let's start a database that tracks investor losses, right? And wins and wins, which is basically track, you know, the wins and losses. Now, I personally can't think of a reason why anyone would be against it. All right. But I'm pretty sure Wall Street will do what they, everything they can to stop it because they know that the moment that we have a database that actually tracks the real cash winnings of, uh, and losses of investors, is basically the beginning of the end for them. Because when people see that people are they're not making money in this negative sum system, um, then, then, then that's just the beginning, right? So, so again, for something, mm-hmm. doing something like this and, and hoping we, I, I guess, uh, I, I, how do I want to say it? When you talk about uh, something to track losses, mm-hmm. uh, getting, mm-hmm. getting, you know, Wall Street getting government, government, it would have to be government mm-hmm. oversight, government regulation to do that. Um, it, mm-hmm. there, there's going to have to be a, 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 enough outrage, correct? Enough enough outcry, I, uh, some guts. I don't know. I, I can't imagine yeah. either party doing it, either political party uh, leading. This is going to have to be led by 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 you. I mean, <laughs> talk, by, by people. Maybe, I mean, <laughs> maybe I'm trying to figure out how that's done because I'm not involved in politics. <laughs> well, I mean, but, uh, you can't but, yeah. you know, because there, it, there's too much. Again, I don't want to. I don't want to get on on, on other other issues. But, mm-hmm. but there's too much that, that financially incestuous relationship between government and uh, he. I don't want to and, and business. You know, they're mm-hmm. they're, they're certainly not going to want to see that you could lose I, again. The the lottery and. I hate to keep bringing the lottery in because it's a very different, very, very different, different mm-hmm. issue. But you know, you don't hear about they don't show about how many tickets lose. You always, if you go in somewhere, you mm-hmm. go to the gas station, they've got all the winners. This guy won a thousand dollars on this ten dollar mm-hmm. ticket or whatever. They don't, it, you know, mm-hmm. because I could probably, you, you know, you could probably mm-hmm. paper a street, street, a main street yeah. with the losing tickets, right? Yeah. So here's the here's the thing though: the, the lottery, it, it's a well known thing that the odds are against you. Um, and it's just something for people to play nonetheless, uh, which is, I'm not sure what the age is. Do you have to be 20? I'm not even sure what the age is to buy a lottery. I'm pretty sure you have to be 21 because it's not a positive something. I mean, the issue with stocks is it's presented as something that you're more likely to win on. And even though they don't know the probability of winning or losing on any stock and they don't know how much money people have lost historically. So... Um, so yeah, it's like, if you hear a lottery commercial, at least the ones I remember, it's kind of like got a jingle or something. It's comical, right? It's comical. <laughs> um, <laughs> where's the stock? <laughs> yeah, here's something about investment, Merrill Lynch or, or something like Ameriprise. It's not comical. They're actually really trying to sell you some, something. <laughs> they're, tr- they're trying to make sure they sell you something legitimate. They're not jingles going on in the background. <laughs> so yeah. that's why I do know about the difference in their commercials, right? So. Yeah. Well, the jingles, I mean, I, 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 I dare say, and let me ask you: Are you good for a couple more minutes, or do you want to split? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm, I'm good with time. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm having a great time with you, Tom. I, I uh-huh. would say, you know, it's it's kind of like the for the drugs, the, you know, the drug ads. You know, they what, what do they mm. do? The drug ads. They they you know they're they're, they're they, you, you see people walking in fields and birds around when they're talking about <laughs> all the all the negative yeah. possible side effects of these drugs. You know, could be immediate death. Yeah. Could be this. Could be you know cancers. Could be and and but they've got two people holding hands and the butterflies and the birds are, are singing and <laughs> right so it's kind of like like yeah. the stock market and the lottery I, again again people need to know that the whole thing i what i love about what you wrote regardless of the people that um you know or the pushback that, that some people are getting and, and getting getting a lot of mm-hmm. positive too as i'm, I'm looking at a lot of people you know it's, it's a, a mm-hmm. wake-up call one person it's a real wake-up call i i agree 
at least have the yeah. knowledge going in. Know what know what you're going into. Understand it. And then, you know, I hate to use that overuse for knowledge is power, but it is. At least you know. Yeah. And then if you t- decide to gamble, if you decide to do that, then you make that decision. But know going in mm-hmm. what, what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's why, like, literally, if I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I don't really care if people uh, gamble in stocks. I just want them to know the game, game they're getting into. And I'll just add right now that... Uh, whoever's listening to this, I don't, you know, whatever their opinion of me and whatever they, they think of this conversation right now, I seriously encourage them to at least go to the YouTube channel and listen to the introduction for the audiobook trailer and just understand the, um, the game that they're getting into because uh, the game is not what they think it is. I mean, there's a lot of false information that, that finance people present out there. One of the biggest falsehoods that I'll just throw out there because Please, my crypto ahead. always brings this up is, uh, is, um, is, Basically, oh, what about happens when a company buys back stocks? Don't companies buy back billions and billions of dollars for the stocks every year? And the truth is that might they might actually buy back some stocks. But here's the problem. No one pays attention to how many stocks they issue before and after those buybacks. OK, uh, yeah. Google, again, is a perfect example. In 2016, they, they bought back. They said they bought back five million shares. But if you look at their SEC filing, all my facts come from their SEC filings, by the way. I don't go to. I don't look for stories on the internet or reporters reporting random stuff. I look at their SEC filings. If you look at Google's SEC filings for 2016, you'll see that the shares outstanding did not go down by five million shares, hmm. like if it, like it should have yeah. through a buyback. Yeah. It actually increased by three million shares. So if they did buy back five million shares, somehow eight million more shares entered the market somehow okay yeah, so yeah, it, so yeah. the whole thing is kind of is a scam and i asked one of my friends who's investment banker why would they do this why would they say they're buying back five million and then not really buy it back he said well they did it to pump up the price of their stock <laughs> so that's what he said right i mean at the end of the day me and him yeah, we don't yeah. know the definitive reason for for why what happened there but I we uh, the the bottom line is very obvious. The bottom line is their shares outstanding did not decrease by five million. It actually increased by three million. That's the bottom line. And the thing is, this is this kind of false information, of course, about the buyback, which it's not totally false, right? It's just that you don't cover. <laughs> they just simply didn't talk about all the shares they issued before or after. Um, but it's 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 always out there in finance. You hear on CBC this this stuff, and, and S and P reports these buybacks yeah. so they don't they don't take into account all the other stocks that they issued right before which is a scam so. yeah. which i think which is which is really really important which again really important and, and again i'm going to mm-hmm. say again i believe knowledge is power and i've also got a link up to the youtube channel also in your facebook page because again people need to mm-hmm. do it read it read it get the book order the book read the book uh, mm-hmm. understand it and 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 talk about it with people. Again, these are things that this is really, really something important that people need to have a better understanding of. And I am, yeah. I'm grateful that you did this, Ton. I'm grateful that you, you did it. But because, again, I'm going to say I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage. A tremendous amount of courage Thank you. to do what you've done with this. Thank you. And I, I really, seriously, I really, really admire you for your courage also. in Yeah. Your, you sound no, like- thank you, Louis. Because like, because I'll tell you right now, like I tell people too, if there was a way to present these ideas without my name being attached to it, yeah. I would have done it. I would have done it. Uh, but this is one of those books. I mean, I'm not into it. it's become famous or anything like that. It's just you live with this information in your head, and you see how crazy the world is. You, you just got, you just want people to know. And I'm the one. Some people could just keep their head down, okay? But I'm like, I guess I'm not just I'm not that type of person. If I get angry about something, I. <laughs> you want to speak I let the up? whole world know. Well, but you, um, but you, I, I had to defend these ideas with my name in it. Uh, I had to basically talk about these ideas and defend them with my name on it. And I, I truly, and I mean this from my heart, I hope, I'm sure you hear the sincerity, I admire your courage because, again, the nail that sticks up can get hammered down. You know, you end up being, you know, the, the, the guy that brought this forward. And I know <laughs> it takes, it takes cur- cur- courage. And if you, when you combine, you know, there's courage. And when there's intelligence with it, when there's somebody that's been so analytical as you have, I just, I, I love that about you. And again, I think it's a 
vitally, I know it's a vitally important book and people need to share the information, get the book. A- again, theponzifactor.com, theponzifactor.com. We've got links up at louisfreeshow.com, et cetera. I hope we can catch up. I know it's relatively new. I want to catch mm-hmm. up with you down the road a little bit if, if you don't mind. And so let's stay in touch. Oh, Tom. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. You do yeah. a wonderful job. Thank you so much for being on the Louis B. Free Radio Show, Brain Food from the Heartland, and the extra time. Grateful for you, and I admire your courage. Thank you, Thanks, Louis. Tony. Thanks for having Let's me. Let's do it again. Thanks. Bye. 